Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to, pretty much as advertised, just give you a quick update on the Irish Agri Environment Scheme, which is called GLOSS, and also just discuss a couple of policy, actually two policy areas, uh, where archaeology and built heritage are, are, are discussed in Ireland. Uh, just to put things in a bit of context, uh, there, on, on, I work for the National Monument Service, and in our system we have about 120,000 archaeological monuments recorded in obviously various states of disrepair, um, some of them very in very good condition and some of them with no surface trace at all, but uh, 120,000 of them nonetheless. And as you can see, I've shown you this kind of very bad slide of, of uh, one of our, map, of our map from the Historic Environment Bureau, just to show you that all the little red dots are archaeological monuments. So you can see that they're not uh, concentrated in towns, they're mostly in countryside, on farmland and in private ownership. So really, and I think it's fair to say that until very recent times, most of the archaeological monuments uh, built in Ireland were built by farming communities. And, and therefore, we've been making the point over the years that the preservation of archaeological monuments in Ireland, you can make a very strong case for it being a farming issue. And it's important to recognize that the reason that we have so many is, is partly because at least farmers were interested in them. They weren't just not destroying them because they couldn't. And uh, that they, when they get some recognition in that, in something like the Agri-Environment Scheme, it, it makes sense. And it's possibly something we can apply to other areas as well. To give you a quick kind of retrospective of uh, Agri-Environment Schemes in Ireland, we've had three to date. We, uh, reps, uh, the first one there, closed for reasons you can well imagine in July 2009. I think a lot of things closed in Ireland in around 2008, 2009, and that was one of them. And the Agri-Environment Scheme that replaced it had no archaeological actions in it at all. And then uh, in 2014, they opened the current one, Green Low Carbon Agri-Environment Scheme, known affectionately as GLOSS, uh, which also actually is the Irish word for green. So they, they were very, they put a lot of thought into choosing the name. Uh, to go very quickly through the structure of it, there are three tiers of actions. Uh, priority environmental assets, as you can imagine, get, get you priority access to the scheme. The archaeological actions, therefore, as you can imagine, are, are in tier number three. I think we're all familiar with this situation where you know, you're getting archaeological actions into what really is, is a scheme designed to deal primarily with other things that aren't of an archaeological nature. But at least it's in there. It would be difficult, but they say not impossible to get access to the scheme just by choosing general actions, such as the archaeological ones. But really, they're just aimed at enhancing the, the main objectives. Um, the, the two archaeological actions, the overarching kind of term uh, for the archaeological actions in Gloss is that they are aim, the aim is to enhance and maintain visible archaeological monuments in the farm landscape. And the two ideas, there's one for tillage areas and one for grassland. One is to put a buffer around monuments and tillage. And the buffer was something that's been in use in, in the agri-environment scheme since the start in Ireland. And it's simple and effective. And uh, we were quite happy to keep it. But we also asked then that they might put in a, an action to do with re removing encroaching uh, vegetation from monuments. And this is something that arose over the years because in the previous uh, first agri-environment scheme, the practice crept in of fencing off monuments. I think farmers felt, what better could you do for a monument than to stick a fence around it and nothing can get near it? But the result, of course, was that uh, they became quite overgrown. And this is just a kind of a small step to try and address that and get rid of some of that you know, new and encroaching vegetation. So the statistics on it so far, approximately 50,000 farmers in Gloss, of them 4,100 have opted for the archaeological options, which comes down to 6,400 monuments on their land. So it's not going to change the world, but uh, you know, it's 6,400 more monuments than we're maybe getting looked after in quite the same way you know, before uh, the, the actions were put in place. The payments are really too small, we all know that, but we, we've kind of taken the view that it's a, it's a foot in the door, you know, it's a start and it's something to talk about in the, in the next um, uh, rural development programme. Now I've put this slide on just to remind me to stop and look back, rather like the, the bovine there that you can see. And it's just to, to uh, it, uh, describe first the, the idea of kind of how we've built up relations, I suppose, with the, the, the Department of Agriculture over the years. Because when we first had an agri-environment scheme, the contact between the National Monument Service and the Department of Agriculture was, was very sporadic. It, it was infrequent. There wasn't really a kind of a channel of information. 
And we would say that certain kind of errors maybe crept into the schemes over the course of the years because of that. And uh, we were very keen to form you know, closer relationships with people in the Department of Agriculture. And over the years, uh, we did that. Um, we were able, for example, to point to the fact that we deal with the Department of Agriculture, over the, in the last maybe 10 years or so, our dealings with the Department of Agriculture and a variety of other areas have increased. And we were able to refer to them then when we were trying to get into conversations about agri-environment schemes. Um, I would deal daily with my colleague Emmett Burns there in the Forest Service, which is part of the Department of Agriculture, but there are a couple of other areas that we deal with them as well. Um, we also began to get into the position of, of meeting um, agricultural inspectors on site to discuss archaeological issues on occasion, which hadn't happened for many years. And we f kind of found that they were in the position of dealing with an issue that they didn't fully understand. And when they got quite a, a straightforward and simple, clear answer from an archaeologist, you could almost see the weight lifting from their shoulders. And uh, they began to see the benefit, maybe, in, in having this more regular contact. So in the lead up to the, to the current RDP, we had quite good meetings with people from the Department of Agriculture, including in, in one of the early ones, a meeting where uh, we were told that we had sent in a submission about the Rural Development Programme and the Department of Agriculture hadn't noticed it. And they said that we should raise our profile. So we took that as constructive criticism and went ahead trying to do that and find out who we should be talking to. You know, the, the handful of people that we really needed to be in touch with uh, in the lead up to the current, um, to the current RDP and, and GLOSS and all the rest of it. And I suppose what came out of that then was, as you know, uh, there is a farm, you have to set up a farm advisory service uh, uh, at the moment in Ireland, there are about 833 farm advisors uh, on the Department of Agriculture database. Some of them are in the private sector, and some of them are employed by Chagas, which is a, a farm training and advisory body I'll, I'll discuss very briefly with you later. Um, in one of our meetings with the Department of Agriculture, uh, it's something that we had always wanted, actually, from, from uh, the beginnings of our attempts to get something into the current, an archaeological action into the current agri-environment scheme. We wanted to uh, be in a position to speak to the people who were uh, advising the farmers on, on a variety of issues. So in one of our meetings with the Department of Agriculture, we hit upon the right person and we, we, we said we would be very happy to address your training events and give a talk on archaeology. A talk would be given by an archaeologist from the National Monument Service. So uh, we put together a talk there, and just about that particular slide, that's just the first slide in the talk, just to show you. Uh, the person that we spoke to when I first showed her that slide, she knew where it was, so we kind of knew we were onto the right person straight away. And I won't go through the whole talk to you, but the punchline really with it is that these, these are you know, the conclusions that we want people to leave the room with, if you like, at the end of a, a short talk. We want them to know where they find information about archaeological monuments in Ireland. We want them to know who they should contact. Uh, the, the basics about, you know, that we cover issues about uh, fencing and grazing and all the rest of that. But also, I'm very keen that they should leave the room thinking that a farm advisor seeing an archaeological monument in front of them on a, on a farm would be thinking that what they're looking at is something that may have been in existence for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's not going to be in the best of condition. And they just need to have an open mind as to where the external perimeter of it is when they're setting up their buffer. So that they bear in mind that, you know, there'll be archaeological information perhaps beneath the ground that they're not able to see. So they need to have a think about it, maybe ask about it. And if they leave the room uh, with that sort of level of basic knowledge, then, then we're quite happy. So in the course of the last year, I think I've actually spoken to all of them. I've gone to about four or five training events and there have been hundreds of people there actual uh, farm advisors and also some students as well. So I think we've kind of covered them all and hopefully we'll continue to do so in, in the future. Uh, also in a related matter, we, we, there's the, the, the Chagas is, is another uh, body in Ireland. It's the Agriculture and Food Development Authority. And we've very good contact with Chagas over the years, particularly <coughs> with one individual. And they produced their Gloss Actions Information Manual. And uh, they, co they contacted us asking for us to kind of proofread their archaeological information and also to give them some decent images for it. And we are very, very happy to do that. So that, that manual will be, you know, very liberally uh, spread amongst landowners and, and advisors across the country. So uh, that 
link has been very important for us as well. We've got four pages of archaeology in it, which is really quite quite helpful. So to, with regard to the future then, what might happen in the, the next RDP, um, in 2015, the Department of Agriculture designated archaeological monuments in Ireland as landscape features. And as you know, that means that they uh, obviously can't be removed or interfered with, but they, they're seen as directly affecting biodiversity and can be used as ecological focus areas. Now, that's the logic of the, the position when they get designated as, as um, landscape features. But it hasn't, this hasn't been specifically stated in the Department of Agriculture literature and so on. They're not saying, yes, by all means, use an archaeological monument as an ecological focus area, even though they're kind of tailor-made for that purpose. But we, when we asked, fortunately, again, because we have reasonable contact with the department these days, we were able to ask the right person how would they react if somebody were to come and ask them to use an archaeological monument as an ecological focus area. And they said they'll consider each case on, on, uh, and it would be considered. So I think, I think we'd be reasonably hopeful that that will happen. And again, it won't be a huge number of monuments, but, the, but it'll be uh, monuments and tillage areas, which, of course, would be in some maybe a greater danger and could be a useful thing to be able to do. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, the words that's coming from uh, Brussels at the moment about the cap and what things might be in it, they're saying they've more ambitious attitude to greening. Well, we can agree with them on that. We can give them archaeological monuments as ecological focus areas if they really want them. They're saying it's not, it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all policy. But we're sort of making the point that 120,000 monuments in a small country, you know, is something very specific to us. And, and really should be catered for if they're going to say it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all policy. Um, uh, we can also say that the, the, the measures within GLOSS at the moment are very measurable, uh, which they always like, and they talk about strengthening the socio-economic fabric of rural areas. Well, I think we can say, and I'll be talking about this uh, more in the next few slides, that uh, there is a kind of a, certainly a, a sort of, a, sort of an off-farm income aspect to her, to build heritage as well. So what we're two minutes. Two minutes. Oh my God. Okay, forget <laughs> that. We just I just tear through. Uh, well, so just to go into the uh, related areas that I was going to talk to you about. At the moment, there's a feeling that Ireland is coming somewhat out of recession, and there are a lot of national plans coming out. Uh, one of them is this uh, national planning framework, and you can see there. I'm just. Uh, I don't want you to read all of this stuff, but just. To, let you know there are a lot of words about built heritage in these plans. In that one, there are two policy objectives that mention it, uh, saying that this, uh, recognizing the, the special value of built heritage assets uh, in the development of the country, and a connection down below then with uh, rural tourism. So this is kind of built heritage, tourism, community, rural development sort of uh, aspect coming out. It's repeated then in the National Development Plan, where they've allocated 285 million to build a natural heritage uh, to be spent over the next 10 years. Um, and they, rec they, they specifically mention uh, the, the state's heritage portfolio in that respect. And then the government departments are making their own kind of sectoral plans, and this is the one for the department I work for. Um, but what I want to say to you about that is that they, they, within the sectoral plan, obviously there's quite a bit of built heritage in the plan for this department. But two of the, the uh, reports whose findings it says this plan will support, and they're just in the bottom paragraph there, are uh, the Action Plan for Rural Development and Growing Tourism to 2025. Now, the interesting thing about those two is that the National Monument Service made submissions when the public submissions were asked for, for the tourism plan, and we were also quite involved in meetings to do with the Action Plan for Rural Development. Now, I'm not saying, and, and <clears throat> uh, so if you like, Things that found their way into the tourism plan and the action plan for rural development are now being used to support things that are in our own sectoral plan. So I hope I'm explaining that well. What I'm really saying to you is, if you get a chance to make a submission, a public submission for something in an area that isn't directly related to yours, it might come back and help you in your own plan sometime in the future. So keep kind of a, an eye out for those. And I'm going to very quickly, I won't spend more than a meeting 30 seconds on these two. Um, the tourism plan, you know, it has quite a lot about built and cultural heritage in it there. Uh, I won't go into it. The, the kind of curious one is the one at the bottom there, where it says that it's important that any future fiscal or financial measures to support the built heritage sector fully reflect the contribution that tourism makes to supporting the viabilities of Ireland's built heritage assets. So it's saying that tourism is supporting built heritage. 
which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and and the the uh, the action plan for rural development is just making this point that cultural and heritage tourism, the, the that built heritage are assets that are dispersed around the country. And that's very good from their point of view because it's rural, it's community development and all of that. And very briefly then, there's one more policy which is the culture policy. And they're saying a very clear statement there that our built heritage is one of the most tangible components of Ireland's cultural heritage. And it mentions archeological monuments, the only one that does in fact use the A word. And uh, it follows through in their implementation of these policies as well. So what I'm saying really is that rather similarly to the way with the, uh, this is my last slide, with the agri-environment scheme that, um, you know, in, a, in our submissions to the Department of Agriculture about the, the forthcoming rural development plan, we'll be hoping to take what they have said or what has been said at you know, EU level and feed it back to them in the, in the form of a public submission. There are a lot of things in, in the tourism area, uh, policy area, and the culture policy area relating to built heritage as well, which we will also hope to take at some future point and feed back to them and say, well, you know, it was your idea, and here's how we think you should maybe implement that. So my, my conclusions, I guess, are seek out opportunities to make submissions about things outside of your own, perhaps, uh, policy areas. Try and build up a few personal contacts. It's maybe quite easy in a small country but like ours, but it's, it's very important, I think. Um, underline the idea of monuments being an asset rather than an inconvenience. And I think there's also a, a, a potential, in Ireland at least, that in rather the same way that the, the, agri, the archaeological actions in the agri-environment scheme draw funding towards monuments, that in the tourism area, there, there might be a potential for some kind of a parallel uh, thing. Now, whether we can convince anyone to do anything like that is another story. But uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring it to your attention anyway. Okay, uh, last slide. Thank you. Thank you.